Howdy y'all, Beardy Carpenter here. We haven't been able to get a video out here lately. We've had a lot of things going on in the family and I uh, had a little accident with my thumb and it's healing nicely. Still a little sore, but I can work with it now. And we have some questions that we're gonna try to answer. And so I'm gonna start with the easiest one. And somebody had to ask how long I've been growing this beard. Well, I haven't shaved in six years. But in that six years, I've probably had trimmed off of my beard. And if I added the inches up, probably 30 inches of beard's been trimmed off in, in six years. This question wasn't actually in the comment section of the, of the post, but it has been asked me different times what got me interested in, in log cabins. And I actually covered that in the very, very first video that we did and I was sitting on the porch of the very first cabin that I ever built. It has always been in me. I've always liked the, the old ways, uh, the country life living, the frontier style living. Ever since I was a little bitty boy, log houses and log cabins or barns or whatever I happened to see, they fascinated me. And since I did like the old ways, and that just seems to go hand in hand, a log cabin uh, out in the woods or, or wherever, I have said this different times that living in a log cabin or a log house, it's more of a lifestyle that I really, really enjoy. There was a question about using red cedar, and the question was, how long of a span can eastern red cedar be used for ceiling joists if they were used in a 16-inch center? Now, I've never built with eastern red cedar. I have in my hand a piece of red cedar that we have here in western Arkansas. Well, it's all over everywhere. This is actually a juniper. Now, it is red, and it's what we call red cedar. It's very aromatic. People use it for uh, blanket chests, uh, use it for trim. It's a lightweight wood when it dries out. Some people use it for fence posts, but for structural purposes, I would never use red cedar that we have here. And since that's the only red cedar that I've dealt with, I'm not sure exactly what the strength of this would be used horizontally. Now, vertically is a lot different. Uh, people here will cut cedar trees and use them for pole barns, but they're just uh, used vertically and they, they'll set them in the ground and build just a, a roof over the top of it for hay barns and such. For my own purposes, the red cedar that I'm acquainted with, which is what I've got in my hand, I wouldn't really want to use it in a horizontal position if I put a live load on it. Now, I'm guessing that you may want this to be exposed, if I'm thinking correctly, because it is a real pretty wood, and pe a lot of people love to work with cedar. I think you probably could use it as a ceiling joist if you didn't have weight above it. But I think I would keep the span down to a minimum. But the best thing to do would be check with your, your local building codes and see if they have any suggestions for you in that respect. There's different things that you can do on ceiling joists that actually strengthen them. You can put what we call a strong back on top of it, which is just a two by four nail to the top of the joist, and then a two by six or a two by eight uh, nail to the side of that, which will give it strength. But there again, I would check with the building codes locally where you are to make sure what they would allow you to do. Someone wanted to know if I have ever built with Douglas fir. Yes, I've worked with Douglas fir, but it was in stick framing, working with my dad, and I would hear the stories that he would tell of when he was in Southern California in the late 40s, early 50s, of the quality of Douglas fir that they got in those days. Now the quality of Douglas fir we get nowadays is not like what he was able to use back then. He enjoyed working with it. Now as far as building log cabins with it, I have never used Douglas fir logs for log cabins. I've worked with cypress, I've worked with oak, uh, red oak and post oak, white pine and yellow pine. 
Now where we are in western Arkansas, yellow pine is a big industry. You'll see log trucks going down the highways very, very often. We have three big, big sawmills within an hour's driving distance from where we live. Now I think if you wanted to use Douglas fir for logs, that would be good if you have access to Douglas fir. I don't have access to that here. I would have to have it shipped in, which would really make the cost of it uh, pretty pricey. So I use what I can get locally, which is yellow pine. If you have the, the Douglas fir, I think you would have a good log to build with, and I think it will last a good long time. If you take care of it and keep, keep a, a good roof on it, that's actually one of the, the insurance policies of keeping a cabin going and living a long time is keeping a good roof on it. In answering the question of the, my preference on the diameter of logs, that's really difficult to say because I love them all. Uh, whatever size I've got, that's what I'll use. But I guess the preference would be in keeping things proportional, which I try to do. The bigger the cabin, the bigger the size logs I would like to work with up to a point where they're, you know, you can actually handle the logs. I've worked with the logs when I worked with Al and Gary. They were huge. Uh, they were heavy and they were big logs. Some of them were 28, 30 inches. Uh, I remember doing one log and the number of that log sticks in my mind and this may not mean anything, but it was 2CL and that log was 30 inches in diameter and it was sawn seven inches thick and it was really, really heavy. And it, it was a yellow pine log at that. I like to, uh, to work with logs that are nothing less than 10 to 11 inches on the tip, which is the little end of the log, the, the top of the tree. And I guess a good, a good size, perfect size log might be 12 to 14 inches at the midpoint. Uh, but I have worked with stuff that's 11 and 10 inches at the midpoint, which is getting a little bit small. Although if you're building a smaller cabin, they look good. Uh, when you, once you get the chinking in, they, they do look good. But I guess, the, you know, 12 to 14 inches would be my, my preference, I would say, to build with. Because they're logs that I can handle by myself, you know, fairly easy. And my hoist will pick them up and I can roll them around and set them on the wall wherever I need to. But if you have logs that are smaller, you can definitely build with them. I've seen pictures, and probably you have too, where logs were pretty small, but that's what they had access to when they built their cabins. So to answer that, I would say 12 to 14 inches midpoint, that's measuring halfway between the tip and the butt, or the big end of the log. That, that's my preference. This was the playhouse for the kids when they were little. These logs are four by eight. They're just sawn four sides, and I had the same notch dimension all the way up. But this, you can see my hand completely covers, and I don't have big hands, it completely covers the log. But this little building, just being six by eight, this size log was just perfect for the, for the aesthetics and the proportion of the size of the building. Another question that was asked was, do I always use a one and three a template when I'm laying out and cutting the dovetail notches, and yes, I do. Uh, this is the one right here that I've always used, and I'm actually the second owner of this, or maybe the third. This was given to me by Gary, my friend, and it's actually on the back of it, it has stamped in it one and three. I've laid out quite a few dovetails with it. Now, I have some new ones here that we just recently had made at a machine shop. These are the same uh, template that I have here. They just don't look as worn. And we have some of these available. And we'll leave uh, in the description below, we'll, we'll leave you some, some information about that. I have a chart that I've, I've made, and it's actually on a PDF file that you can download of the notch dimensions, the upper and lower numbers that you would be using for different size logs. I have a, a video that will be in the description that you can go back and actually watch to see how I, I do that. But it makes it handy if you just have a chart to where you can just refer to the chart. And occasionally I do still refer to a chart. I don't always refer to it. I can, I've pretty much 
have an idea of what my notch dimensions are going to be from the previous rounds that if I'm going to a smaller size log, which I always start with the larger logs on the bottom and gradually work to the smaller logs until I get to the top plate, which I then go back and look for a, a big log to use for the top plate. But if you have a chart that's, that you can refer to, it makes it so much easier for you. In answer to the question of uh, the blocking that I put in at, the, at an opening, this is going to be a doorway. I have here, there's a piece of three quarter inch plywood, a piece, a piece of half inch, and looks like five sixteenths of plywood right here. Now this amount of blocking will vary. It depends on how deep you cut your flat spots for the blocking to actually set on. Now, when I put the blocking in, I have a center line on these logs that I have snapped on there. And I stretch a string from corner to corner on the center line, and I can raise the log up to the, where it comes to an opening and get that string right on that center line, and that will determine how much blocking you have to put in. Now this blocking stays in there. I don't take it out. I don't know if you can actually see the angle iron that I have right here that I'm touching. There's a, a two by three angle iron that's curved into the end of these logs, and that allows them to settle which is actually in, in part of an answer to another question about the settling. But I leave this blocking in. It stays there, and I chink over the top of it. I've been asked by several people in the comments to the videos about building with green logs. How long do I let them season, or what moisture content do I, do I try to bring them down to? Personally, I like to build with them fresh cut just with the, the bark peeled off and work with them as soon as I can. Since I do work mostly with southern yellow pine, it's easier to work while it's green, and I do allow for settling. As I showed you, I, I put angle iron in the openings, and there are other things that you need to consider to allow for settling for interior walls. I don't have a wall that I could actually show you that's framed, but you need to allow either at the top of the wall or at the bottom for some settling to take place because there, there's going to be some settling working with green wood. Now, I'm going to crawl underneath our house and hope I don't get attacked by anything under there. And I'm going to show you a screw jack that I have underneath a post. There is a summer beam that goes across the width of our house that has five posts on it or underneath it rather, that support it. It supports the whole second floor. And so I'll, I'll take you with me. I'll show you what I'm talking about in a screw jack. Okay, I'm underneath our house and this is a post. It's a six by six post that goes through the floor and supports a nine by nine summer beam. There are actually five of these posts that come through the floor and they're sitting on top of a concrete pier. And this is the screw jack that I was telling you about. This is a piece of Acme thread, and it's got a bolt or a nut here that's welded to a piece of quarter inch uh, plate. And there's another plate here. And this nut right here can be loosened and as the settling takes place, you can come under here and loosen this nut and let the, the vertical timbers, which in this case is post, you can let them come down a little as you need to. And I can keep the summer beam straight inside the house. And this is just one of the things that can be done to allow for settling. Now, I'm not the only one that does this. Many, many log builders use screw jacks. I love doing this. It's very therapeutic for me. I just like to swing a broad axe. It's pretty physical work, but it's, it's enjoyable. 
There was a question asked of what I thought about building with D-logs. Well, I've never really built with D-logs. I remember back about, oh gosh, I guess it's been about 18 years ago, I did some repair on one for some people, and that has been my experience is working with D-logs. Now, I realize there are many, many styles of log cabins of the way they put the walls up. There's the D-logs, there's the button pass, there's the, well, what I do, the, the half dovetail, round logs, full Swedish cope, and they all look great. So it'd be what your preference would be. You normally would be using smaller size logs than what I work with when you're doing a, a D-log. They are round on the outside. They still have the, the curvature of the log on the outside and they're cut flat on the top and the inside and bottom. And so it kind of has a little bit of a D appearance in looking at the end of the log profile. If that's the style that you would like to do, by all means, go for it. Uh, just make sure that uh, you have a good roof overhang on your structure. When you're dealing with D logs, the sap wood or the round part of the tree is on the outside. So you want to keep that as protected as much as you can. Now, I've been watching a, a fella in Montana. His channel is called On Beaver Creek. His name's Fred, and he is really, really good uh, at what he does with his log building. He's done a lot of stuff. And he has an excellent video that uh, I would suggest that you go and watch. It's where he was building with D-logs and he was doing a dovetail notch on them. He has jigs that he uses where he can cut the notches with a chainsaw. And he gives some really, really good advice on building with D-logs and, and other styles too. So I ask that you go check him out. He is a, he's a great guy. And talking about the different styles of logs, there is another channel that I would like to mention, and I would suggest that you go watch this fella. Now, on his, his channel, he has been building a, a round log cabin, and he has given much detail during the process of his cabin build. Uh, he's a retired millwright, and it's just amazing what this fella can figure out. He, he's just a I just think he's a genius. He, he's a great guy. You can learn other things other than building with round logs also on his channel. But check him out. It's Duke, Mr. Duke at Rough Cut Homestead, or his other channel is Worm Getter. The last question that we have is what kind of stain or what type of stain would I recommend for logs or that I use? There are many products out there that are good products. Uh, there are different log home company suppliers who have products. Permachink has a good product, different stains that you can get to put on logs. There's a product you could probably get at your local hardware store called CWF or TWF, which stands for clear wood finish or total wood finish. And I've used that before, not on logs, but I've used it on decks and, and things of that nature that's uh, needs to be able to withstand some weather. Now, personally, what I like to use is the old boiled linseed oil. I've been using that for years and years and years and have always had good success with it. Now, that's my personal preference. Uh, you might do some research and find something that you would like better than the boiled linseed oil. The boiled linseed oil will, will soak in the logs good and it's a nice preservative. A lot of people use it to put on axe handles or hoe handles or shovel handles that are made of wood. It's been around for a long time. It's, it's a tried and, and proven product. 